and uh, I will ask uh, Professor Peterson to start. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so um, I'd like, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like the audience to do something with me. The first thing I'd like them to do, if you would, is if all the women in the audience would stand up, that would be much appreciated. Okay, now, thank you very much. Now, perhaps all the men would stand up. Okay, good. So I did a rough count when I came in here, and I, I might be out, but I'm not out by much. I think it's about two to one males in here. And uh, I thought I'd point that out because it's, it's kind of interesting to me because I'm a personality psychologist and this debate is about ideas and there's a personality trait called openness which is uh, associated with intellect and creativity and there are pronounced gender differences in openness such that men are higher in intellect which encompasses interest in ideas and women are higher in aesthetics which encompasses interest in well, in art and literature and that sort of thing. And, and it's partly for that reason that men read more nonfiction and women read more fiction. And I just wanted to point out that there was a natural gender divide that occurred automatically and without compulsion in this particular case, in the case of this debate, and that the more our society uh, enforces its increasingly absurd demands for equity upon everyone, the less likely it is that such natural divisions will be able to manifest them in our, manifest themselves in our society in keeping with the pronounced and deep differences between the genders. So, I just thought that makes an interesting initial, uh, what would you call it, real world demonstration. So, okay, so about two months ago, I made these videos. Um, I did it because I was trying to articulate my concerns um, um, for a variety of reasons. I've been keeping an eye on political correctness for a long time and I was also very upset with the Human Resources and Equity Department's decision to make anti-racism, so-called anti-racism and anti-bias training mandatory for their staff, which I regard as an unacceptable intrusion into their staff's right to their political opinion, as well as noting that there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that mandatory anti-racism and anti-bias training has, its, has the impact that is claimed. In fact, the empirical evidence suggests quite the contrary. When you mandate that sort of thing, you actually make people more prejudiced. It's also based on what I would say is a, a rather pernicious form of pseudoscience that's been promoted by social psychologists, a group that I have a fair bit of trouble with, and that's been transformed into a kind of educational fascism that has no grounding whatsoever in the empirical literature. Now, what happened as a consequence of making these videos was, um, was really quite unexpected to me. We've, we've been trying to keep count. There's been 140 print articles published about this, um, whatever this is, in the last two months, and then dozens and dozens of, of YouTube videos and television interviews and radio interviews and demonstrations. Millions of people have been tuning into this online. And so obviously something's up, and I can tell you that what's up isn't only a discussion about Bill C-16 and about gendered pronouns. You know, sometimes when you're having a debate or a discussion with someone that you love and you're having a, a little argument about something, like who's gonna do the dishes or something like that, or and you know how it, especially if you haven't been getting along very well with that person, you know how the discussion starts with something specific and then you start trading all the things that it might be about until you're arguing about, you know, the way that you behaved on your third date, you know, 10 years ago and the whole underlying unresolved chaos of your relationship emerges through the little portal that was defined by the argument. You know, well, that's what this is about. So what, what the hell is going on here exactly? And why are we damn near at each other's throats? Look at what happened in the, in the United States a week and a half ago. There's some things to talk about here, and I started to try to talk about them. And I would say that my freedom to do so was rapidly infringed upon. My career was put at risk. And, and I find this absolutely unacceptable because I am trying to sort this out. And believe me, you know what you call people you can't talk to? Enemies. And if we want to divide our society into armed camps of enmity, all we have to do is keep doing what we're doing. And I would recommend that we don't do this. I've studied authoritarianism for a very long time. I know what happens when things get out of control, and it can happen extraordinarily rapidly. And I would say we're on the cusp of that. And so we need to start talking and listening 
And when you talk, it doesn't mean you're right, it doesn't mean you're correct, right? It means you're trying to articulate and formulate your thoughts like the boneheaded moron that you are. And you're going to stumble around idi idiotically because what the hell do you know? You're full of biases and you're ignorant and you can't speak very well and you're over emotional. And you know, you've got just problems that you can hardly even imagine that are interfering with your ability to state something clear. And so what you do is you do your best to say what you mean and then you listen to other people tell you why you're a blithering idiot and hopefully you can correct yourself to some degree as a consequence of listening to them. And you see, that's what free speech is about. Because you, you have to... It, it isn't just that people can, can organize themselves and their societies by thinking. You can't do that because there's only one of you. What you have to do is you have to articulate your thoughts in a public forum so that other people can attack you, and hopefully in a corrective manner. And then you want to you know, step back a little bit and think, okay, well, you know, I was a little arrogant there, and I was a little over-emotional there, and I didn't get that quite right, and maybe I'm outright biased on that front. And you, you want to correct what you say, because then you correct how you are, and then you correct how you act in life, and then you correct your society. And, and to the degree that we limit free freedom of expression, we put all of that at risk. You know, I'm a clinical psychologist, and one of the things, there's two things that we kind of know about why clinical psychology works, and one is that people get stronger if they voluntarily expose themselves to things they're afraid of and that they're disgusted by. It's like a, it's a hallmark of clinical psychotherapy, and I would say it's also the defining characteristic of, of appropriate human adaptation, right? Is that you have to confront the chaotic things that you don't understand and then learn to master them and articulate them. And the other is that clinical psychotherapy works because people can come, say, into my office and they can say whatever they have to say, no matter how incoherent it is or how psychotic it is or, or how overbearing it is or confused or jumbled. And sometimes it takes my clients months or years of continual conversation just to start to untie the hundreds of thousands of knots that have been badly tied in their minds. So, and that's partly why I don't believe that freedom of speech is just another value. I think that's preposterous. I think that if you claim that, then you know nothing about Western civilization and history. Is freedom of speech is not just another principle. It's the mechanism by which we keep our psyches and our societies organized, and we have to be unbelievably careful about in infringing upon that because we're infringing upon the process by which we keep chaos and order balanced, you know and and if chaos and order go out of balance then 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 all hell breaks loose and and the situation is not good and we've seen that happen many many times in the 20th century right since the late 1800s our societies western societies have been careening madly between the hyper repressive order of the radical right and the absolute devouring chaos of the radical left we've become unmoored we've lost our bearings and the only thing that can possibly save us from continuing to do exactly that is the dialogue of exactly the sort that I'm, I'm, I'm describing at the moment and what we're attempting to do today in this forum. Thank God the university agreed to have this debate. You know, because there's things to talk about and if we don't talk about them then we're going to fight. Well, what is this all about? I can list you some of the things that it's about. It's about inclusion versus bigotry and prejudice, right? It's about the left wing versus the right wing. It's about who's free to choose their language and what, what, what elements of respect that you're due to people who are different than you, say with regards to pronoun use or chosen names. It's about whether the subjective or the objective is going to take precedence because implicit in Bill C-16, and I'm telling you, there's an assault on the idea of objectivity itself, an assault on the idea of biology itself. And if the university thinks that the sciences are going to be immune from the ideological doctrine that's embedded in these, in these pieces of legislation, they better think again because there, there is trouble coming. I know that OISE already has an anti-psychiatry program and we noticed that Ken Zucker got hounded out of his job just a few years ago even though he was an entirely credible scientist and clinician. So, it's about constructionism, social constructionism versus positivism versus prag pragmatism and there's, there's a mother versus father thing going on here too and you know you kind of saw that with Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump I would say that was the overproductive devouring mother versus the tyrannical father which is not a good that's not a good narrative from a mythological perspective it's about also the adversarial spirit I would say versus the logos that's at the deepest possible level of analysis and the adversarial spirit is the spirit that claims what I think right now is correct above all else and I have nothing whatsoever to learn versus the logos and the logos is a very complex 
idea and maybe the deepest idea of, of humanity, I would say, certainly the deepest idea of Western civilization, and that's that the proper citizen is the person who embodies truth in speech and attempts to act it out. And that also includes listening, because listening is part of communicative intent. And I think at the moment that we're, em we're embroiled in a war on every single one of those dimensions and several others that I haven't had time to list. And the, the evidence that we're in that sort of war is precisely the fact that this has attracted so much attention. I mean, I just sat in my bloody office at home and threw up a couple of amateurish videos, more or less attempting to articulate my feelings about a couple of policies. And it's like all hell broke loose. And why? Well, because that hell is right underneath the surface. I hate to stop there, but you're at the end of your time. <laughs> I'm done. So I'm going to read you something that a graduate student sent me from the University of Toronto the other day, and I, I can also tell you that I've received hundreds of letters like this. Today, I had a tutorial at the University of Toronto where I talked about Jordan Peterson and issues of personal identity, legally sanctioned identity categories, etc. I brought up a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a university how they'd react if he told them he identified as a woman, as black, as short, and as five years old. Spoiler alert, students in the video resist some of the later categories a bit, but are mostly accepting. Still, students were not engaging in discussion. I asked them why. One said it was because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or saying something offensive. I asked who else was not speaking for that reason. The whole class put their hands up. That was shocking to me. I encouraged them to speak despite their worries and they gave me some good feedback on how to make it easier for them to do so. For instance, by working in pairs and being assigned an opinion so that they didn't have to be responsible for it or feel bad for defending it. No participation. Why? They weren't uninterested. They were afraid to speak their minds. The PC police are in your heads. You just heard a lawyer's opinion. I have many lawyers' opinions, by the way. I'll start with lawyer one, who was the counsel to several prime ministers. He talked to me about the Human Rights Tribunal because I went and saw him two weeks after this all started. Human Rights Tribunal is a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and it should be abolished as fast as possible. It's one of the many institutions in Canada that pose a threat to your, to your freedom that, that is of almost unimaginable proportions. Here's what this top lawyer told me. If I'm taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, it will cost me $250,000. I will pay the legal costs for my opponents, and I will lose. He said, go back to your safe little life and shut your mouth. Second lawyer told me, my critique of the Ontario Human Rights Commission is spot on. And absent the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has these contradictions built into it that you just heard described, much of what I was saying was illegal and has been illegal since 2012. Lawyer three told me that if I breached a tribunal order, so imagine I was taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal and I was fined and then I refused to pay the fine, which I've stated that I would do. That equals contempt of court, which inevitably means jail until the contempt is purged. He told me the social justice tribunals, and that's the technical name of these essentially extrajudicial bodies in Ontario, by the way, the social justice tribunals, so the PC authoritarian types aren't even trying to hide their terminology anymore. The social justice tribunals and the SJWs, social justice warriors who staff them, have a rogue nature. They can search your house without a warrant. They can use secret hearings. There are no rules of evidence, and the judges are unaccountable. Your worst fears of the effect of a poorly written law will manifest in that environment. The SJWs say only the worst of the worst will get punished. Think again with them at the helm. Anything can and does happen. But... Those are legal opinions. Let's, let's look at a real world case. Let's look at what happened when I made my videos. Let's look at how the university responded. Because I can tell you, in the video I said, look, what I'm doing is probably illegal and worse 
my employer is legally responsible for it because that's built, in, that's built into the codes as well. So by the way, if you're an employer, you're responsible for everything that your employees say and everything that in, anybody interprets what they said as being, whether it's unintentional or intentional, whether or not a complaint has been made. So just think about that. Anyways, October 3rd, the university said, like all members of the university community, I have an obligation to comply with the law, including the provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Their policy with regards to workplace harassment, which the university implied that I was engaging in, engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct, where the course of comment or conduct is known, or ought reasonably be known, to be unwelcome. That was the October 3rd letter, which was sent to me within one week of posting my videos. And it was the first. So what happened, essentially, was the university reviewed what I had done, and then they reviewed the policies as laid out on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, where you guys can all go read them, by the way, and then you can decide if, if, if the legal information that you were just provided with, it with is in any degree whatsoever accurate, because I would say it isn't. Um, the university reviewed my videos and they decided that what I said was true. They decided that the video I made was probably illegal and that they were responsible for it. And so in an attempt to distance themselves from me, under counsel from their legal people, and believe me, the university has good legal people, they sent me a warning. And this is what happens if you want to discipline a recalcitrant employee, essentially what, so that you don't have to bear legal responsibility for their acts. You send them a warning to show that you're not in favor of what they're doing. Then if they continue, you send them another warning. And then if they continue, you send them a third warning. And after the third warning, you can take further steps. Now, I pointed out to the university at one point when, when um, we were discussing how this forum was going to proceed that perhaps it would be in their best interests to not support the people who are trying to stop me from talking, but instead to support me legally and, if necessary, to take this all the way to the Supreme Court. And the university said categorically that they would not do that. So I would say, when it comes to the contradictory provisions that are in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and so we might say roughly equality versus freedom of speech, the university decided which side they're going to go down on. And, you know, people tell you all the time, that this has to do with compassion, you know, and it's obviously the case that all of the compassion in this discussed is discussion is on the side of the people who are, who are um, in encouraging their listeners to play victim and perpetrator. And I can tell you as a psychoanalytically oriented psychologist that there's nothing more horrible for children and developing people than an excessive compassion, right? That's the standard Freudian devouring mother. And if you want a little archetype, uh, to go along with that, I suppose most of you have seen um, The Little Mermaid. Remember Ursula? Ursula wants to put King Poseidon's soul in a little jar in her collection and she wants to take away Ariel's voice so she can't establish herself as a conscious being in the world. And I would suggest very strongly that all these people that continually talk to you about compassion do not, in the least, have your best interests in mind. And there are far more virtues and values than an excessive pity for people. You know, you don't want to pity your children even. You want to encourage them to develop in, strong and, in a strong and forthright manner so that they can go out and take on the world. And an excess of compassion just ensures that when they're 40, they're going to be living in your basement, plotting evil routines about the world because their ability to manifest themselves as successful beings has been absolutely compromised. And I think that we're seeing this played out we're seeing this played out in society, and, and, and I think it's absolutely horrifying. So on October 18th, the university mentioned to me in another warning letter that if personal pronouns are being used, the refusal to use the personal pronoun that is an expression of the person's gender identity can constitute discrimination. So now, you see what's happened is that I haven't refused to use someone's gendered uh, gender neutral pronouns. I said that I would refuse. So it's not even the refusal itself that's producing the letters. It's my declared intent to engage in the refusal. And as far as I was concerned, what I was essentially doing was criticizing a piece of legislation that had not yet been passed. But the university's legal department decided that all that was sufficient for them to distance themselves from me and to engage in disciplinary activity. So and then, with regards to these human rights tribunals, where all of this stuff would be sorted out, it's like, those places destroy your reputation and destroy you financially, and can they put you in jail? Well, it's a complicated argument in some sense, but I can tell you that if you refuse to pay the fines, that's the next step. So, I think you're being sold a bill of goods here about how benevolent the intent of Bill C-16 is, and I also know because another lawyer told me that 
the, because I suspected that the Ontario Human Rights Commission people were behind all of this legislation, essentially speaking, in Canada. And that, that's actually the case because the federal people have indicated that these policies will be interpret, interpreted in accordance with the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policies online. And so you guys should go read those because those are not fun. And I would say that they pose an incredible threat to your liberty. And it's all done under the guise of compassion. It's like, I don't consider myself a particularly compassionate person, let's say. I think I'm more compassionate than I should be for my own well-being. But I can tell you that that is not the only virtue. And people who keep pushing that on you are making a massive mistake. And they're infantilizing you. And they're terrifying people in the university community, as you can tell by the letter that I just read. And I really, I received dozens of letters like that. People are afraid to say anything because they're going to get targeted. And if you wonder or not if that's true, then just think about what happened to me. And ask yourself if it's true. Good enough. Thank you. Um, so, Professor Peterson, I'll start with you since you were the first speaker. Um, of course, there, there are a few lawyers on the stage here. Law seems to figure very prominently um, in your argument and in many of your concerns. And um, Professor Kosman has obviously set out a number of the issues in terms of what the laws actually say. You cited in response a number of legal experts, and one of the things about legal experts is there are a lot of them and they often don't agree. Um, but um, in law, we tend to distinguish between the law as it is and the laws we would like it to be. And the experts you cited seem to be critical of the law as it is. Um, along with you, um, but does Professor Kosman's outlining of some of the elements of C-16 in particular, does that give you any comfort? Does it allay any of your concerns that it really focuses on the advocacy of genocide or the commission of hate crimes and that those kinds of things are probably the sort of restrictions that most people in the room would think were reasonable restrictions? No, I, I, it doesn't give me any comfort. Um, and the, the reason it doesn't give me any comfort is because as far as I've con I'm concerned, what this is actually about has already played itself out in my case, and I already explained, explained that to you. Um, I, I want to tell you some of the pernicious things about the, about the legislation. And, and this is... And do you mean C-16? Actually, I mean the policy guidelines that it will be interpreted within, because the, the legislation itself is only a couple of paragraphs, and it, and it looks innocuous, but... You know, I would say a, a, a legal doctrine is something like a virus, and it has a life. If you, if That's you let not it, what we think. If you, if you let it go into a living system, it, it propagates, and it has effects, and the effects are a consequence of the philosophy that's embedded inside the law. And if you really want to know about this, you should read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, because what he does in that book is tell you how the hypothetically humane doctrines that were embedded in radical Marxism at the end of the 1800s unfolded into Soviet society and demolished it, along with many other societies, I might, I might point out. And he won the Nobel Prize for that for no small reason and was regarded as one of the people who brought down the Soviet Union. And so it's a masterpiece, that book, and this is a complex issue. And to understand it, you have to do that sort of reading. But I want to tell you a little bit about what the law does. And this is with regards to its uh, interpretation from the policy guidelines. It instantiates social constructionism into our legal system. You have to understand what that means. There's a huge debate about how human identity is, is, is um, upon what grounds human identity is predicated. Now, the radical social constructionists basically say that identity is nothing but a social construction, and that, that's in keeping with their philosophical doctrines, partly Marxist and partly, partly postmodern. But that isn't, and that was what I was objecting to with regards to Bill C-16, because it insists, do you understand this? It makes this legal doctrine that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation vary independently. And they don't. Now, the reason they don't is because 98% of people, it's 99.7% of people, by the way, at least with regards to the most credible statistics, have a gender identity that's essentially identical with their biological sex. And almost everybody who is male and female by biological sex and gender identity dresses that way, and that's what it, gender expression essentially is. And then, if you stack those three things on top of each other, they're basically isomorphic, you can add sexual orientation to that, and 98% of people are heterosexual. So the idea that those things vary independently is absolutely preposterous. But it's written into the law. And that has terrible consequences. You see, 
I don't know, for example, now, to what degree any discussion in universities of the biological differences between men and women are legal. And you think, oh well, that's an exaggeration. It's like, well, they, I debated Nicholas Matt, I believe that was his name, a professor at the University of Toronto on TVO's The Agenda, and he said right out for everyone to hear that the scientific consensus is that there's no biological differences between men and women. And I've received letters from people who've told me that now the social justice activist types are complaining about the fact that the biologists assign biological sex to animals because it's only a social construct that we're projecting onto their being. And, um, you know, we just heard that the, cr the chromosomal level of analysis is complex. It's not that complex. What we have is a bimodal distribution with a tiny number of exceptions, and that, by the way, is not a spectrum. You see, so these Professor words... So, Peterson, sorry, we're at the end. Oh, yes, yeah, okay. You'll, you'll have other questions. No problem. <laughs> Um, the law has been regulating social constructionism and social constructs since there was law. Um, language, nationality, religion, citizenship, family, marriage, there's no there there. They're social constructs. Um, our, our social constructs go to the very root of our common law tradition. Property, property law. Okay, sure, property exists. It's there, right? But the idea that we own it, the idea that we own property is entirely socially constructed. Um, intangible property, futures, contingent liabilities, where are they? I can't feel them. I can't feel them. They're, where are they? They're socially constructed. These are the things that law regulates. Um, let me talk about one that, you know, that Professor Peterson is, is quite fond of, um, the right to freedom of expression. This is entirely a social construction of the Enlightenment. It didn't exist before the Enlightenment, um, of humanism and of liberalism. It depends on our understanding of democracy. It depends on our understanding of what a right is. It depends on our understanding of what a freedom is. And it depends on our understanding of what expression is. Um, the idea that the law regulates social constructs is beyond irrelevant. Actually, I think you were just starting at the end of your, um, of your discussion in your answer to the last question to talk a little bit about uh, some of the points that Professor Bryson made about your, your picture of gender and, and um, the relationship between sex and gender and some of those issues. And, um, you know, she, she lays out some of the science and some of the actual scientific findings um, around, those, around those issues. And I wonder, when you, when you take a look at some of that research, does it in, how does it affect your, your thinking on some of these questions about, is in particular, um, okay. what some people think of as perhaps a rather simplified picture of sex and gender? Okay, well, a couple of things. The first thing I do, I, I want to make a quick comment about um, Dr. Crossman's critique of my analysis because she actually didn't address it. I didn't say that the law shouldn't regulate social constructions. That's what the law does. That's what she said. That isn't what I said. I said that the law now builds in a social constructionist doctrine into the fabric of the law. That's not the same thing. Obviously, the law regulates property rights and all of that, and to some degree, those are social constructions, although not to the degree that she claims. But this is a whole different thing. This builds in a philosophy of identity, and one of the things it builds in, for example, is the claim that identity is only subjectively defined, and that's built right in. It says that. Your identity is whatever you think it is. Well, let me tell you, as a practicing psychologist, that's absolute rubbish. Your identity, to, look, when, when children are two years old, that's what they think. They think that their subjective reality is everything, and what you do is you socialize them between the ages of two and four to adopt uh, an identity that's part of a cultural negotiation. It's like your identity is part of a cultural negotiation. It's partly the game you play and partly the game that I play with you, and I have to be a voluntary participant in that. And not only, not only is it not subjectively defined, which detaches it entirely, by the way, from the underlying biological and the underlying objective reality, making any claim you want for your subjective identity valid. The other thing it does is... Um, It, it completely obliviates the idea that identity is actually a pra pragmatic entity, for God's sake. It's like if you're a lawyer or a father or a mother, like an identity that has some solidity to it. Say, well, for most lawyers anyways. So, um, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help it. We're used anyways, to it. <laughs> uh, 
your identity is also a vehicle within which you travel through life, right? It's a set of tools, a set of pragmatic tools that you use to interact with the social and the natural world. It's not only your subjective whim. So, okay, and so, and with regards to the science, it's like, really? You know, I can give you just one example, and I'll, and I'll stop with this, and hopefully I can do it quickly. The idea of gender identity, which, which is only defined subjectively in, in, the, in the relevant law, has been studied in, intensively by personality psychologists such as myself. In fact, my lab has done some of the, I wouldn't say the most fundamental research on it, but, you know, we're in the, ball, and we're in the ballpark. Here's a little story. Okay, so the, the differences between personality between men and women are basically what constitutes gender identity in, insofar as it's not merely subjective. And one of the things that's happened is that as the Scandinavian countries have equalized their political and sociological landscape, the differences in identity between men and women have got larger, not smaller. Do you understand that? That's a refutation of the social constructionist claim. So what happens is that if you flatten out the landscape so that there are very few socioeconomic differences, say, or sociological differences in the treatment between men and women, what happens is the biological difference maximizes. It maximizes. You understand that means men and women get more different, not more the same. And the thing about women in the audience, bloody hell, you should think about this. Because don't you want to pursue the things that you're interested in? And if you pursue the things that you're interested in, because you're interested in different things than men, I'm telling you. And if you look at the interest... <laughs> If you look at the interest variation, this has been established technically, if you look at the interest variation, there's almost no overlap between men and women if you sum up the differences in so inter interest and temperament. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pronouns. Let's put pronouns in some kind of context. And I think it's really helpful in going back to what Justice uh, Minister Wilson Raybould said yesterday following the passing of C-16, and I'll quote, it's our collective responsibility to recognize and reduce the vulnerability of transgender diverse persons to discrimination, hate crimes, and hate propaganda. And a lot of what we've been hearing here is hate propaganda. Uh, Professor Peterson, let's start with you. Uh, so this question says, um, you present your issue with Bill C-16 to be that the infringement of freedom of expression regarding gender pronouns is a problem. Do you hold the same stance with other discriminatory language in the Human Rights Code, such as being able to use uh, racist uh, terms uh, with regard to students? And if you believe that one of these things is a violation but not the other one, why? I'm not sure I read that out okay. all that yeah. well, but yeah. you get the idea. Okay, well, so one, one thing I would like to point out be before I answer that, just so you all notice, is that I have, in fact, been denounced today and what I am saying has, in fact, been described as hate propaganda. So, one thing I'd like to suggest to you, every single person in the audience, you're next. So, keep it in mind. All right, so, with regards to the question. Well, first of all, I don't think that these issues are the same. I don't think they're the same at all. I mean, I've think, been thinking about the pronoun thing, you know, because one of the things that people... Uh, it put me back on my heels for a while because the claim was basically, well, it's something like, why doesn't the mean professor just play nice and, and respect people by using their pronouns? And it took me like three weeks to unpack that because who gets questioned about pronoun use? I don't know why the hell I use the pronouns I use. I use them because they're part of the language. I use he and she because that's what everyone uses. And so then I had to think about, well, why, why do we, in fact, use pronouns? And, we use them in part for the same reason that we use other categories, and that's to simplify the world for functional purposes, roughly speaking. But then I was thinking, well, is the use of he and she a mark of respect? And the answer to that is, well, no, it's not a mark of respect. It can't be a mark of respect. What you call four billion people can't be a mark of respect, right? It's a, it's a mark of basic categorization. And so then the claim comes up, well, if someone wants you to use a particular pronoun, then you're disrespecting them if you don't. It's like, hmm, okay, let's think that through a bit. Well, that assumes that when I'm using he or she for, for people in, you know, in normal parlance, that I'm actually indicating my respect for them. And that's not true. It's like, if I don't know you, I class classify you generically, and basically I classify you in terms of how you present yourself publicly. I suppose that's your gender expression. And then I nail you with whatever pronoun seems to fit. It has nothing to do with respect. And besides that, you bloody well don't get to demand my respect. Why should you? 
you know, I mean, it's not like I respect everyone. That's a foolish thing to do. You respect people who are respectable. You know, you, you make value distinctions between people, and that doesn't mean you illegally discriminate against them. Those aren't the same thing. But I'm all for value judgments. If, if you don't buy value judgments, then why bother learning anything? Why, why bother doing anything? Why go from one point in your life to another if the next point isn't better in some manner? So don't tell me that I'm not respecting people when I don't use their gendered pronouns. And the other thing is, I don't buy this whole idea that the people who are putting this legislation forward are valid representatives of the trans community. That's what they say they are. We have mechanisms for deciding whether someone's a valid representative of a community, and that generally involves democratic voting. I've received at least 20 letters from transsexual people who are on my side, and by the way, zero from others, believe it or not, who are perfectly happy with the idea of gendered pronouns, it's just they want to be the other one. Now, you can have a discussion about that, and there's lots of things to be said about it, but the idea that this community that's coming out and these, demanding these rights is somehow representative of this homogenous, oppressed minority, I think is rubbish. Back to you, Professor Peterson, uh, again from the audience. Um, as a clinical psychologist, um, Refu is Professor Peterson, sorry, um, as a clinical psychologist, refusing to acknowledge how damaging it could potentially be to an individual to disregard their identity? Um, the first thing I would like to say to Mary Bryson is that this is an invitation if she would like to debate, if she would like to debate um, the relationship between biology and gender identity, I'm extending her an invitation to do so. I'm sure that any number of student groups would be more than happy to host it, and I'll put my knowledge of the peer-reviewed literature against her knowledge Let, of the peer-reviewed literature. Let's go to literature. the question, though. Um, identity is a very complicated thing, and you know, when I engage in clinical discussions with my clients, it's all about their identity. And so the idea that, uh, it's a very difficult question to even engage with, because I don't understand it's, I don't understand it. It makes things so simple that you can't discuss them properly. All I do in my clinical practice, and I have about 20,000 hours of experience with clinical, in my clinical practice, and I've dealt with all sorts of people, far more variation in people than the typical person ever encounters, and I think I've done it at least reasonably competently. All my discussions with people in my clinical practice are about their identity, given the definition of identity that I brought forth, how they feel about themselves, how they conceptualize themselves, because those are two different things, how that plays out in their interactions with other people, and what the functional significance of that is. And I'm, I'm going to say forthrightly, well, two things. One is that I don't believe that any of my clients have had cause to worry about my interpretation of their identity because what I do in my practice is help them discover what that is. I'm really, I'm seriously not interested in imposing any ideas of identity onto someone because I don't, I can't do that. I don't know what the right vehicle is for you to travel through life. What I can help you do is articulate your concerns. I can ask you questions where I see contradictions in your self-articulation. I can help you make plans for the future. And I've helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people, by the way, make plans for the future with the stuff that I do online. And so I'm helping people build a genuine identity. Um, well, and that's what I do. So. That's the answer to that question, and, and I think I do it well. I mean, in, in the stuff we've done from a research perspective with the Future Authoring Program, which I offered to people free a week and a half ago to help them catalyze their identities, we've helped 5,000 university students increase their grade point average 20% and decrease their dropout by the same. And the biggest effect has been with men and, and non-Western ethnic minority students who've accelerated their performance up beyond the range of the normal for the, for the dominant culture. A pure psychological intervention, I might say, and not a sociological intervention. So I'm perfectly willing to stack my record on identity formulation up against anyone's. And, and, so, and I should also point out that I think where I'm most vulnerable in this entire debate, and I expect this will happen, and you know it, there's already been noise about it on the Ontario Psychological Association website, I think they'll, that they'll probably come after my clinical license. So that, that'd, be my, that'd be my guess. So, so I think we might be straying a little away from yeah. the question okay. now. So uh, just uh, thank you. Um, so, um, no, no, we're not, because that, that, question, that question involved my clinical practice. I'm not straying a bit. That involved my clinical practice, and there was a reason that the question was posed. So I'm not straying. Thank you. 
Another uh, question uh, for Professor Peterson. Um, why do you feel that someone's personal gender identity and pronouns infringes your free speech? Can one not also argue based on your interpretation that professors can use racial slurs in their classroom um, and the, that the inability to do so would violate their freedom of speech? Well, that's pretty much the same question, I think. Um, <clears throat> I think that we're crossing a dangerous line, and the line is the requirement that's being put upon people by government agencies with the full force of the law behind them to decide what language categories you're going to use. Now, I think that's a form of compelled speech, which has a technical meaning. I know in the United States, the American Supreme Court ruled against the government's right to use compelled speech in 1943. I understand that this isn't the United States, but we share a common law background and the doctrines are relevant. Um, for me, you see, when I opened this debate, this forum, um, I tried to explain what this is about and I couldn't explain everything that it's about because it's about too many things. But one of the things it's about is ideology and the distinction between the left and the right. And let's say, now, I truly believe that these made-up pronouns, of which there are many, dozens in fact, and there's no consensus on them, and that doesn't even begin to start a discussion about the use of the other kin pronouns, and you can look those up if you want, because if you can define your identity subjectively any way you want, then there's absolutely no reason that you can't claim a non-human identity, and you may not know, but in the LGBT uh, rainbow coalition there is Q plus and the Q plus people include the other kins who claim a non-human identity and they're arguing in that rainbow coalition that they have the same right to their um, to their pronouns that everyone else does and their pronouns include such things as wor worm self you're not supposed just, to interrupt actually I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the I don't pronoun think there's use. any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference between hear I'm want. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made-up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems. And I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. <laughs>